How many of you have seen or heard of a, a, a television series called The Office? Yeah, yeah. Okay, there you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's uh, about four more than in Lachlan. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I, I had... It's a Netflix. Well, it is now, yeah. So I guess it maybe always was. I, I, I don't know. It ran from 2005 to 2000 and I'm going to say 12, but nine seasons. So it's been, it's been a while, or maybe 13, some, somewhere in there. And uh, it starred Steve Carell, and for that reason, I wasn't watching it. But, <laughs> but uh, my, it, I spent a lot of time with family, and they tend to binge watch things on Netflix. By binge watch, I mean a couple of episodes at the end of the day after the babies go to bed, before they crash. So we've been watching The Office. And I, so, so, you know, and Steve Carell is very off-putting at the beginning. But the thing is, there's this whole character development. He's the, he's the office manager, and he thinks he's everybody's friend, but nobody likes him. And so, but, but as, the, as the plot unfolds, he slowly gets absorbed and, and uh, kind of well, part, he slowly becomes part of the game. <laughs> and so it's a story, not unlike many stories that we enjoy and we watch, we like this theme where outsiders actually become insiders. It's a huge theme. So uh, uh, I've talked before about big, the Big Bang sitcom. It's the same thing. All these outsiders, these geeks, these you know, kind of outcasts from the cool crowd, slowly you know, accept each other. Uh, Sheldon, <laughs> who, uh, who is the most, uh, in, m- most annoying, good, good word, <laughs> It's a great show. He's the most annoying, but slowly, slowly, everybody, they love him, they accept him, they forgive him, he's part of the group. So there's so many stories like that that grab our attention that are people from the outside being brought to the, to the inside. Uh, we have this tendency in human circles to kind of exclude people and have our own little group. And, of course, the, the, it goes from the, the very small events in our own lives and small little groups we may have been involved with or not involved with that we wanted to be involved with to huge things like, well, you may have not watched The Office, you probably heard about the Second World War, which was largely about an exclusion-inclusion thing. You know, so Hitler and his madness came up with, you know, he wrote this book, Mein Kampf, and it kind of put forward this whole idea of, uh, of the Aryan supremacy, the supremacy of one particular ethnicity, I suppose, or or race, as some say, uh, human race, as as higher and better and superior to others. And therefore, they should be in charge of the world, right? (laughs) And therefore, we'll do whatever it takes to to make that happen, including exterminating some of the ones we don't like, like the Jews. So it's a huge huge exclusion-inclusion thing, The, uh, the outsiders and the insiders. And, of course, we had this huge, horrible war about that sort of thing. All of us possibly have had those experiences where we were on the outside and we kind of wanted in and nobody would let us in. Um, I, I've had that in, in churches, in, in, well, in particular in one church. I've talked about this church before, which was pretty, uh, pretty weird and cult- culty, but, but the thing was that there was the leader and there would be this kind of coterie of insiders. And others of us wanted, always wanted to try to get to the inside. We would do whatever it took to try to get to the inside. Never, I never really managed it probably just as well, might still be there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, how dysfunctional is that? And how, how not the church, not representative of the church of Jesus Christ? So, and we, we can only imagine how hard it is for people to break into, like, for instance, for, for the states to have a, a black president like Barack Obama. <laughs> Many of us were pretty happy about that because we can't even imagine what it must have been like for him to break through the barriers to get to that point. Or, or for now, now they have a, a woman vice president, Kamala, Kamala Harris. So, uh, but, but for people that are in minority groups in our world, especially in the West, uh, it's, it's been a struggle because there's the inside group. Uh, it, it seems that we human beings work overtime in finding ways to exclude one another. Uh, we we want to build our tribes. We want to, you know, we keep dividing off and hiving off and starting something new, and then, oh, you're not part of it. I remember as a child doing this. <laughs> we had our gang, the South End Gang in Minden. And, you know, we, we were very exclusive. There were like four or five of us, and no, nope, that was it. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it, just, it just seems inbred. Um, 
this way, ways of dividing from one another. And right now it's rife. It's rife in our society where we have so much tribalism and so much you know, animosity you know, the, politically, but also with respect to uh, coronavirus viewpoints about masking and, and, and vaccinations. And it's causing a lot of division uh, and, and thus pain. But uh, so, so this passage is actually about this. This passage today, our Bible passage, which Jane read, is about an outsider and how Jesus accepts her and brings her to onto, into the inside. It's essentially what it is. But before I, I speak about that, I would like to ma- mention that it's kind of a sequel to the last time I preached live, which was, uh, I, I did a PowerPoint called Armor All, which some of you may, no, nobody remembers, it's three weeks ago, so pfft, it's gone. Uh, but the armor all was based on uh, Ephesians 6, 10 to 20, which is this, Paul, Paul telling us that we do not fight. We have, a, we have a battle. We are warriors of the cross, <laughs> but we do not have a battle with flesh and blood. In other words, we, we are not fighting other people. He says we are fighting against principalities and against powers, against world rulers of this present darkness and spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So he just lays it right out there. And he tells us what, what God's equipment, it, 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 the, God, the equipment that God has given us for the battle, like, uh, you know, the, the helmet of salvation and our feet shod with the equipment of the gospel of peace and the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and the shield of faith with which to quench all the fiery darts of the evil one and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and, of course, prayer. So, uh, you know, so he, he says this is, this is the equipment that God has entrusted us with and gifted us with in order that we can fight the good fight. Uh, it's a heavy subject, of course, and I suspect that I didn't emphasize enough that, that in Jesus we have the victory. We, we do not need to be people of fear because Christ has conquered and he has won and he has, you know, he has defeated the ancient foe. Um, and there, there's a whole lot of scripture that, that speaks to this. I, I, I did mention in that, that message, this, this one about uh, uh, in 1 John, we are of God, but the whole world is under the evil one. The whole world. So that's like, oh boy, that's pretty, uh, pretty nice. That's in 1 John, I think, chapter 4. But I think also in the same chapter, he says something like, he who is in you, Christ, is greater than he who is in the world. So to, to encourage us, right? <laughs> However tough it may seem, whoever, the one who is in us, God, which is through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, is greater than he who is in the world. And the principalities and powers he talks about in Ephesians, he also talks about in Colossians, in his letter to the Colossians, where he says, he disarmed, Jesus disarmed the principalities and powers, making a public example of them and triumphing over them openly, publicly in the cross. So, uh, and other places, all through the Gospels, of course, we see stories like the one we have today, uh, where Jesus is casting out the enemy. And he even hands that power over to the disciples. At one point in Luke, Luke chapter 10, he says to them, you know, he's, he's sending them out on a mission, and he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, and I have given you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall harm you. Nevertheless, he says, do not rejoice in this, that the, the spirits are subject to you, but that your name is written in, the, in, the, in, in, you know, written in heaven. Uh, so, so and, and of course, this week, the core story is the story of a little girl who's possessed by a, an unclean spirit, I think it said in the version Jane, Jane read, or an evil spirit or a demon, and, uh, and Jesus casts it out. So, I mean, the reason those stories are rifely just all through the Gospels is to, to display to us the power of Christ and the victory of Christ. Um. This is, yeah, so, so let, let's look at this passage. But before I do, I want to remind you, I, I've told this story before, but uh, a few years back we had a, a vacation Bible school, that kind of a traveling vacation Bible school that was sponsored by our presbytery. It's called The Vibe. Some of you may remember that. And they would come and uh, do vacation Bible school every morning for a week. So they would be maybe here, at, at, they were here at Halliburton Church in the morning for a week, and then they'd maybe go to Minden in the afternoon or something like that. So the, it was young folks late teenagers, maybe early young adults, who were running this program full of energy and fun. <laughs> it was great. A lot, we had a lot of kids come and show up for that. 
But they, they were given this material, and each, each day there would be a, a Bible story. One, and one week, and we had volunteers from our church that were helping with it. And the volunteers kind of picked up on this the first day. I think it was the very first day of the week. This story was the story of the day, the story of the Syrophoenician woman who uh, Jesus has this conversation with. So, so in this conversation, he says, uh, she, she begs Jesus to, to drive the demon out. He says, first let the children eat all they want. For it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. So it looks like Jesus is very being rude almost here, you know, at first at first glance. And uh, a lot of people have struggled with this passage. Well, their take on it, the take that they taught the kids to teach our children, was that basically Jesus was having a bad day. <laughs> he was grumpy, and he was giving this woman a hard time, and then he had a change of heart. Jesus had a change of heart, and he, he got feeling better, and he started being nice to her, and then he helped her out. And a lot of us had a little problem with that. <laughs> it did not sound like what, was, what, what the writer of the gospel was seeking to pr present to us about Jesus. Since, since the gospels are all about presenting to us Jesus, the Son of God, you know, the Savior of the world, the Messiah. And uh, it didn't sound like they were going to present to us grumpy Jesus. So we call this the grumpy Jesus interpretation. We had a little chat with, the, with, the, with, the, with those in charge of the course, and they actually, I think, changed the tune a little bit after we'd, we talked about it. But, uh, uh, yeah, I don't think that's what, what this is about at all. Here's what I think, for, for what it's worth. <laughs> I think that Jesus, being God, knew this woman. In fact, we, we, you know, he, he, it often tells us, even in the Gospels, that he knew what they were thinking. So he knew her heart, he knew what she could do and what she could take. He knew that if he threw her a curveball, she could handle it. And I believe the whole point was to teach his disciples a lesson. Because they, in one of the other uh, Gospels, a parallel Gospel, I think it's Matthew, uh, in the same story, says the disciples were trying to get rid of her. Doesn't tell us in Mark, but, you know, Mark, Matthew tells us they were trying to get rid of her, and Jesus, you know, lets her in and listens to her, uh, and he says... He says, please help uh, my daughters. First, let the children eat all they want, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied. Even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. She has an interesting comeback that I believe Jesus knew she would have. Then he says, for such a reply you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. So again, this is this... It is an example of just the power of Christ. He just speaks the word and it's, it's done. But what, what's going on here? Uh, it's hard for us to imagine how much of an outsider this woman would have seemed to Jesus' disciples. I mean, uh, she, she, was, she was very much of an outsider. She, she, first of all, they were, they were guys in a men's world. And when, when women came around, they, you know, they, they were like, what? You know, if you go through the Old Testament, it always talks about the men sitting at the gate, right? It was a very macho society almost, like masculine. And, and w women were, were relegated to the edges very much. So here's a woman coming, asking for something. They're not so crazy about that. But even more so than that, she's a Gentile. She's a Gentile. Uh, and... Uh, they really, the Jews were raised with the conception that to not have any use or, or contact with the Gentiles if at all possible. In fact, many of them just hated the Gentiles. They, uh, they would have nothing to do with them. They felt the only good one was a dead one kind of thing. Um, and that was, their, and partly because the law, the law of Israel was, you know, you will be, you will be uh, kind of ceremonially contaminated if you have contact with the unclean world. The world that does not keep to our laws and our rules and our kosher, you know, eat, ways of eating and our wash of hand washing, and if you did contaminate yourself, then you had to go through a whole purification exercise to get back on track. So you just avoided people that weren't Jews. <laughs> so, so she's quite quite the outsider. Uh, many of us grew up in a world with a vocabulary that included a lot of slurs against other. Uh, people groups, it, right? <laughs> you may not want to admit it, but I know it's true. It certainly happened in my home. So there were slurs against, a lot of it was unconscious. People didn't even recognize it. Slurs against blacks, slurs against Catholics, 
against the Polish, against the French, against natives. Uh, and Well, you know, now that I know some of the French, I know there was a few, few slurs against the English, by the way, just going to say. <laughs> Uh, against Italians, against Chinese. I mean, we had all these little put-down words that got floated around and little expressions that were just built into the vocabulary growing up. Fortunately, m much of that you know, has come to our attention these days. I think that's a good thing, a good change in society. Uh, you know, as people be, have begun to realize that that's a hurtful thing. <laughs> and we've, you know, we've put that aside. But it's one thing to put away hurtful sayings. It's another thing to have your heart changed. So that you know that you know, you're not better than anybody. But all that, those things that we grew up with, they pale in comparison to how the Jews felt about the Gentiles back in Jesus' day. And Jesus was changing all that. It's crazy radical. And the whole lot of the New Testament is about that. I mean, the Apostle Paul and his mission to the Gentiles and Peter going to the Gentiles, it was, just, it was almost a shocking thing. And it was a lot, of, a lot of what we, the material in the New Testament speaks to. So, but here's the thing. The gospel of Jesus is entirely about including outsiders and bringing them in. It's entirely about that. That's what it is. The gospel is outsiders being brought into the center. So Jesus, and Jesus is the ultimate includer. So to start with, the inside group the only real inside group is God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You know, the Godhead, who, ha who have e eternally existed long before any of us were created. They're the insiders, of course, because they've always been. We're the outsiders. And, and uh, we're outside not just because we're Johnny-come-latelys. <laughs> we're outsiders because God himself, God is holy, and we're not. God is good. We aren't. God is selfless. We are not. God is humble. We are not. God is patient. We are not. God is wise. We are not. There's a huge gap, in other words. We are broken, rebellious, prideful, self-centered, you know. I, I know we're all wonderful people. <laughs> but when the Bible talks about sin, it's not kidding. And so there's this huge gap. But, but God says, I want them with me. I want them in my group. I want to bring them in. And so what he does is he takes radical uh, choices here. He makes, a, he, 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 you know, he becomes one of us. He takes our form. And he enters our world. He leaves his circle. And whilst being one of us, he suffers the, the penalty that a just God, we're not just, but he is, it, suffers the penalty for sin and reconciles the human race back to himself through the cross in order to take us from the outside to the inside. And all we have to do is believe. That's all. He doesn't expect us to, to work ourselves up into a frenzy or to do mighty deeds. We just have to trust in Jesus and what he did. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes or trusts in him should not perish but have eternal life. In other words, be brought into the circle of God. And then once we're in, he transforms us into his likeness. There's a, a verse which I often quote, but I'll quote again, 2 Corinthians. <laughs> we all beholding as in a mirror the likeness of the Lord are being changed into his likeness from glory to glory. So, that, I mean, that's as we, we gaze, we look, we learn of Jesus, we get changed to be like him, uh, you know, from glory to glory. And this is... This is all grace. It's all God's gift to us. It's all his work. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So, you know, our lives are his, are his, his gift and his workmanship, his craftsmanship. That being said, how can we ever turn around and say about anybody, we don't want them? You know, they speak funny. They look funny. They swear too much. They lie too much. They believe wrong, even if it's all true. <laughs> they, well, whatever. How dare we? May we learn to receive and welcome and accept people with all their differences and all their problems just as we have been received and welcomed and accepted with all of ours. Shall we pray?